All right, so I think everybody is here. So um, get started. Um, my name is Carolyn Klauba and I'm the stewardship director for the Sauerland Conservancy. And um, we are so thrilled to have Rachel Mako of Wildridge Plants here with us today, teaching us how to sow uh, native plants and to propagate native plants from seed. Um, if you don't know about the Sauerland Conservancy, we are a nonprofit dedicated to protecting, promoting, and preserving the Sauerland Mountain region. And we do this through stewardship, advocacy, and education. And so the event that you're attending right now is stewardship and education. Um, the seeds that you are gonna be sowing today are from seeds that we collected at our restoration sites. I collected some and we had some folks from Stew Crew, which I know a couple of people from Stew Crew are in this presentation right now watching, which is very exciting full circle, that um, they help plant the plants, they help collect the seeds, and now we are going and planting them. Uh, we really wanna encourage everybody to plant native plants. And I know Rachel's gonna talk more about that um, and the importance of native plants, but um, we also encourage folks to do it themselves by collecting seeds. There are some rules with collecting seeds though. Um, with wild collection, if you're gonna go out and collect in nature, um, you can collect from your own property, that's just fine. But as far as public land goes, there are a lot of regulations with that. So um, talk to the landowner uh, before you go and just snag some seeds. I know it can seem, uh, um, inconspicuous to go out and grab some, but we're not allowed to do that because some of the plants, um, especially in the sourlands, there are some that are threatened and endangered. And it's really important that we protect them. Um, and by collecting those seeds, we're not necessarily protecting them. So I just wanted to put that out there, but we do strongly encourage everybody to get their hands dirty and get involved. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. And um, Rachel is, um, a native plant grower and uh, co-owner of Wild Ridge Plants. And I am so excited for your talk, Rachel. So I'm gonna be quiet and put my listening ears on and um, gonna absorb all of your knowledge. Thank you. Um, thanks, Carolyn, and thanks everybody of the Sutherland Conservancy. It's been actually a lot of fun putting this together. And like many things in the past two years, um, we had one idea and then we had to go to plan B, which is this program now. And um, I can say that it's really nice to be in my warm, cozy house right now, although I would like to be in person. And one day we will be in person and probably outside. So thanks for the warm welcome. I'm always in awe of everything that the uh, Sauerland Conservancy does. You do a lot of work. Um, on behalf of the Sauerlands, which is a place that is close to my heart, which is where Wild Ridge Plants got started. We initially had a rental property in Hillsborough region of the Sauerlands, right along um, Montgomery Road. And then in 2013, we moved up here to Warren County. And you're seeing a picture right now of our nursery. And luckily, we still, we moved from one ridge to another ridge. We're now on a ridge in the Highlands region of New Jersey. So our name stuck, which was kind of convenient. So welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna get started. We're gonna talk about propagating native plants from seed. And this is something that I do all the time. And we'll go through some slides, we'll watch a video, and then we'll go back to slides. And if you have any questions at the end, uh, please let me know. You can put the questions in the chat and um, Carolyn Maya will be keeping track of them. And if anything needs clarification as I'm talking, so if I leave something out because this is sort of old hat to me that I've been doing it, um, you know, I think Carolyn or Maya, you know, raise your hand and say, wait, we're, we've lost you. Um, so again, propagating native plants. And uh, let's see, let me get my controller. Okay. All right. I'm going to see why my controller is not working. Okay, we'll use this one. There we go. So there's two different ways of propagating native plants. One is the one that you see in the foreground, and that's our a small portion of our about acre size meadow that we have, and that's nature. That's nature doing 
their thing. Seeds land on the ground, they get carried around and they germinate when they do. And for the most part, we don't see that happening. The other way of propagating native plants is what you see in the middle ground, which is our nursery. And you can do this whether you have a nursery or you don't. And really the big key that you need to know about propagating native plants successfully is basically what we're doing is mimicking nature. And this is some swamp milkweed at a restoration site in Hunterdon County. And you can see these seeds are bursting out of the pods. They're about ready to catch the wind and move on to another place where hopefully they'll germinate. Here's American beech seedling germinate, germinating in some moss. It's found ideal conditions in which to germinate. And they don't really need to think about it. They just germinate when, when they do. And we'll talk about what signals them to germinate and what conditions they need. And then there are these tiny seedlings. You know, we again, we often don't see these tiny seedlings. We have a chance to see seedlings, usually weed seedlings in our veg vegetable gardens or in our well-tended gardens. They're quite mysterious. So the steps to, so, to sowing and propagating native seeds, the first one has been done for you by the Sourland Conservancy, or if you're getting your seeds from a seed warehouse, there's actually pretty rigorous standards that need to happen if you're buying your seed commercially. Um, viability and they need to be also tested to make sure there's not noxious weed seeds in them. You're lucky enough, your seed packets have been carefully free of all debris that doesn't help them germinate by the Sourland Conservancy. And so here, this is me in the midst of cleaning another milkweed seed separating what sometimes is called the chaff, which is basically anything that's not needed for germination. And then we have the seeds left. Here I'm cleaning some hibiscus seeds with my son several years ago. He no longer has those chubby hands, he's 11. So today we're gonna to be specifically talking about seeds that can be stored dry for a short period of time that don't have fleshy fruit. So ones that have fleshy fruit that you might um, be aware of are something like spice bush, a shrub that has bright red fruits, that flesh that surrounds it, that fleshy stuff needs to be cleaned off because it actually inhibits germination. We're not talking about fleshy seeds today. We're talking about more like your dry seeds that mostly meadow plants. After you clean your seeds, again, this is something that's been done for you already, is you need to store them properly. So if your seeds became ready sometime midsummer, like say wild bergamot, and you've already cleaned them, you're storing them in something like a paper bag, something like an envelope of any kind. So they're nice and dry and they're not rotting and they're free of, again, all the capsules and things that enclose them and you can keep them dry. Plastic bags are good for very short term storage, but no more than a couple days. If you're going out and you're collecting from your yard, it's a nice way to keep everything separate and then have them all nice and labeled. And then you go back and you clean up all the chaff and the pods and everything like that. But you don't want to long, store, long term store your seeds in plastic because that is basically harbors moisture and the seeds will begin to rot. Okay. And again, so when you're collecting your seeds, the seeds that you collect in summer and fall, you're going to wanna to sow sometime around now. You can definitely hold your seeds for a year or more, but viability goes down precipitously after six months. We've held onto seed and germinated seed. We usually keep, if we have extra seed, we'll keep it for about a year, just in case something happens to a crop and we need to re-sow it. And ideally you're storing your seeds in a cool, dry place. So not a spot that is direct sun, 
keeping them away from rodents. You can also store them dry in a refrigerator if you don't want them to germinate. The interesting thing about some seeds, and this is more like for larger seeds and fleshy fruits and a lot of our woodland wildflowers, sometimes they go into something called double dormancy, which basically they've noted to themselves that a certain time amount of time has passed and they haven't yet met the right conditions for germination. So they kind of, again, go into something called double dormancy. And that might mean that they need an additional year or two or more before they germinate. So seeds have this, what I call this inborn intelligence that we here in this workshop are learning how to work with and unlock. This is the big key, this word stratification. This is the key to unlocking the chemical intelligence in your seed. It's called stratification. And it's basically mimicking nature. And stratification, again, simulation of nature. And there's three things that you need in order to stratify seeds. They, the seeds need moisture. They need to experience temperature fluctuations for a certain period of time. So again, moisture. So think about it. That's ice, snow, rain, temperature fluctuations. Those are the seasons and a duration of time, a period of time. Again, that's the seasons too. Those are the three things that you need. And all species have a different sort of, what would you say, algorithm or different combination of those three things that unlock their potential to germinate. Here's a few different seeds. This is Venus's looking glass on the left side. This is a, an annual. You can see the opening on the side of the seed pod and the seeds are spilling out and something like an animal moving past them, a raindrop landing on those will cause those seeds to spill off the leaf, land on a bare patch of ground in Germany. Top right, that is bloodroot. You can see that white fleshy part on the golden brown seed. That is not a root radical. That's not a, a root. That's not the sign of germination. What that is, is called an, an eliasome. An eliasome, this is kind of an interesting concept. It's this fleshy part that actually attracts ants to it. Ants will gather these seeds, eat the eliasome, because really wonderful nutritious treat for them. And then they'll dispose of the seeds on their compost pile. So all the refuse that the ants don't utilize and then they'll germinate in that refuse. So that white is basically the seed strategy to make sure that it moves in some way away from the parent plant. The bottom right, those are ramps or wild leek, another woodland plant and these generally fall to the ground or moved by wildlife too. So you can see these different seed type strategies. The Venus is looking glass on the left is basically as small as a pencil point. Those other ones are larger. You can see the ones in the palm of the hand, the ramps. Okay, and knowing, knowing what each individual seed needs helps us figure out what process to use when we work with these plants. There's different letter codes that go along with different germination types. So we don't need to describe how they grow, how they germinate. So there's starting off A germinators. A germinators are really easy. They just need four weeks of warm, moist conditions. That's really easy if you think about uh, peppers, tomatoes, squash, those are A germinators. As far as native plants, A germinators are our wild grasses and many of our annual plants, so our uh, rubecchias, things like that. B germinators need to experience six to eight weeks of cold, moist conditions, followed by six to eight weeks of warm, moist conditions. So again, your bees, they need to experience winter, moist, cold conditions, and then they need to experience 
that warming trend of spring. The reason why they need six to eight weeks is because sometimes, and especially now in our climate conditions, we'd have a January thaw, or we'd have a certain period of time where for a week or so, maybe we might have a warm snap in the middle of winter. Native seeds have not experienced domestication. They have not had the human hand generally helping them germinate. So they need, the, again, this chemical intelligence that prevents them from germinating at the wrong time. If you have get a pumpkin, you carve your jack-o'-lantern and you check all the seeds in your compost pile in October. And if they have enough time to experience what they need to germinate, those pumpkin seeds will germinate, tomato seeds will germinate, all kinds of great stuff germinates in your compost pile in the fall. What happens? There's a cold snap winter comes and all those seedlings die. But that doesn't happen to native plants because again, they have this chemical intelligence preventing them from germinating at the wrong time. Our bee germinators, we typically will sow now and we're working with a bunch of bee germinators in this program. And there are summer and fall wildflowers, our asters, our bergamots, our bee bombs, goldenrods. Many, many, many of our plants are bee germinators. So we're going to take a minute and watch a video. This is something that we would have been doing live, but this is something I did here at the farm. And so I'm going to not share screen anymore. And Maya's going to load up a short video. It's about 10 minutes long. Hi, I'm Rachel Macko, native plant grower here at Wild Ridge Plants. We're a native plant nursery located in Warren County, New Jersey, and we grow wildflowers, trees, shrubs, and graminoids that are native to our area. We collect all the seeds ourselves, so therefore our plants are all local ecotape. So that means that they're adapted to the conditions of our region. These plants grow up and down the East Coast and into the Midwest. Today, I'm doing a seed sowing project. It's January, and I'm actually almost done sowing all the seeds for the year. Now, why is that? Why have I begun so early as opposed to waiting for spring conditions, which are favorable for germination, right? Well, native seeds need something called stratification. And stratification is essentially this. It's mimicking the conditions that seeds would experience in the wild without the human hand. So what I mean by that is by sowing the seeds now, they're experiencing winter conditions and then spring conditions. And that's the key to unlocking the chemical compounds in seeds that prevent them from germinating too early. Now, what seeds need is about 90 days of cold, moist, shifting then into about 90 days of warm, moist conditions. Again, winter and then spring. That's not the case for all native seeds. There are exceptions, there's always are, and that includes grasses and then sometimes our fleshy fruited seeds, and they require something slightly different. We're gonna sow two different seeds today. We're going to sow some that are tiny seeds that require light to germinate, and then we're gonna sow some seeds that are a little bit larger that don't necessarily require light to germinate. Let's get started. If you've purchased your seeds or you're getting seeds as a part of this workshop, your seeds have already been cleaned. Everything unnecessary to their germination has been removed. Everything that might actually carry those seeds on wind or stuck to animals fur has been removed. So you're just getting pure seed. I've already cleaned these seeds using a variety of strategies. Here they are. This is a milkweed seed, specifically common milkweed, Asclepius syriaca. And after cleaning them, I've stored them dry and in cool, dry conditions. A paper bag or an envelope is perfect. Make sure you always label everything that you do. 
so what we're going to do is get started. I've already filled these trays and I'm going to just gently press the soil. Nice and easy. Don't need to go too crazy on the soil. There we go. Just gently tamping it down. What you're doing is getting a nice surface ready to receive the seeds. You can sow in a variety of plug trays. Here we've got a deep 50 plug tray. I'll show you some other plug trays in just a moment. And what I'm doing is simply putting about two or three seeds per cell. Just like that. Then I'm tamping them down once more. And then gently applying grit. This is a clay grit. It's a non-clumping clay, clay grit that's used for conditioning things like ball fields. Essentially, it looks a lot like kitty litter. And you can use kitty litter in this case. It just has to be the non-clumping kind. As a part of this workshop, you'll be using sand, which is also an appropriate material to cover your seeds. They just need to be lightly covered. You might, in fact, still see your seeds popping up from beneath the grit or sand, and that's okay. Just a light cover. They don't need to be buried. Now, what we need to do is very important. Label your seeds. I have pre-printed labels here as a part of the nursery, so I can simply do this. Or I can take a blank label and use, believe it or not, pencil. Pencil will not wear off in the weather. It will stay despite whatever the climate throws at us. Things like indelible marker actually don't weather rain and ice and snow as well as pencil does. You can also try a grease pencil, but pencil is nice and sharp and very precise. If you don't have labels, you can also use masking tape and again, write with pencil, not pen or indelible marker. Basically, we're all set. We're going to put this to the side and then we're going to do another type of seed, a little seed, very tiny. Here's our next plug tray, all prepared. Again, I'm going to gently firm the soil. Don't need to go too hard. Nice and easy. While we're taking a little break here, I'm going to show you a couple different kinds of plug trays. We've got this one very shallow, a lot of openings here, a lot of what we call cells. This is really great for annual veggie growers. In fact, I think this came from one of our friends who does annual vegetables. The reason being that it's not as great for natives is because you can see how shallow and small each cell is. That means you really need to be cautious about watering. It needs to be kept moist. So we tend to not use those. Another option, which is probably what you're using for this workshop, is this. It's also quite a tall container, and then there's fewer. These accommodate nice deep roots that will be great for transplanting later in the spring. So here we go. Our next seed is actually quite tiny. Lobelia syphilitica, or great blue lobelia, which is related to cardinal flower, lobelia cardinalis. The seeds are actually quite, quite tiny, even tinier than the tip of my pencil, I'd say. So this, you want to go nice and easy with sowing your seeds. Just 
sprinkle a little bit. You may want to, in fact, if you have limited number of seeds, divide your seeds up before beginning to sow. And it's quite amazing, even though the seeds are quite tiny, wildlife do utilize them. Every winter I marvel at the slate colored juncos who come and harvest the tiny seeds of the different pycnanthemum or mountain mint species. You'll notice once again I am firming this soil nice and easy. And there'll be no need for top dressing of any kind because these seeds do need light to germinate. Like I said, all seeds are unique, all seeds are different. Once again, I've got my pre-printed label. I'm going to pop that right in there. You can take your pencil and your masking tape or your label and make sure you mark that. What you're going to write down is the species name, the date that you've sown it. So that way you don't get mixed up if you have trays that are left over from previous years, you know exactly when you sowed them. Your next step is to take your trays with the sown seeds and store them in a place that is exposed to the elements. Again, we're stratifying these seeds. They need to experience winter moving into spring. It's not just the temperatures, it is that moisture because the seeds remaining moist are know that they experiencing the conditions that are ideal for their germination. An ideal place to put them is one that is protected from pets and rodents. Rodents sometimes do eat seeds, especially the larger ones. These that we've sown today, the kernel flower, grape lobelia, the milkweed seeds, tend to not be bothered by rodents, but still, you never know. So a place that is covered on the bottom with some kind of mesh and on the top as well. You can leave these covered in a plastic bag in a place like a garage or a shed, which are not heated. You'll have to periodically check for two things, moisture. You want not, a, not too much or not too little. So periodically you may need to water your seeds gently with either a spritz bottle or something very gentle. You don't want to flood the seeds out. And again, ideally, if you can, leave them outdoors, just protected. Sometime in spring, May, June, possibly even later, your seeds will germinate. All plants are different. So watch them, especially once it begins warming. If you have stored your seeds in plastic, in a garage or shed, you're going to need to check them. If they're outside, check them as well, but you'll need to be less on top of them. When they germinate, of course, they'll be quite small, very exciting, and they'll need periodic watering, especially if the spring tends to be dry, and our springs have experienced a lot of dryness in the past several years, so just be careful of them. They'll be ready to transplant when you see a few different aspects of them become robust. One thing you'll notice is if you look underneath, you'll see vibrant roots coming out of the bottom. You'll also see vibrant top growth. You may see plants about four to six inches tall, and at that point, they may be ideal to transplant. You'll also want to check the stems. Are they robust, resilient, strong? Can they withstand things like wind and rain and planting in the conditions of your particular garden? Thanks for joining us for this Native Seed Sowing Workshop. I'm Rachel from Wild Ridge Plants, and this video is brought to you by the Sourland Conservancy. All right, can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. Okay, some really great questions came in. I'm going to answer them now, and then they'll be answered again shortly. So the one question that came up in the chat was, so how much water is the right amount of water? If your seed trays are going out into 
an area where they're just covered under some kind of mesh, like a hardware cloth mesh or plastic mesh, you really don't need to water them during the winter. It's going to be moist enough. There'll be precipitation and ambient moisture. When they begin to germinate, that's when you really need to check on them and really begin watering them, making sure that they don't dry out. And when it starts getting warmer, you're gonna to need to be on them. So what you want is evenly moist, which is sort of this perfect middle ground that we're all striving for in life, right? So not too dry, not too soggy. So you don't want, especially if your seeds are covered in plastic and in a garage, and they're really sopping wet, there's a strong potential for them to rot. And that's why having them outside is the best. So if you have them inside in a plastic bag in a garage, and this is the other question. So I wanna be clear, you can do one of two different things. One is your seeds are outside your trays. You know, just imagine this is my tray with all my cells and I put this outside exposed to the elements and there's nothing protecting it from ice, rain, snow, that tray is experiencing all that precipitation. It's receiving all of it because there's no barrier. That's great, that's perfect. And you can kind of more or less ignore it until spring and it gets warm. The other option is if you don't have a place outside, like say you live in an apartment, say you have pets and you can't leave things in the yard, say you can't build a little protective structure for them to be outside and be unbothered, then what you do is you take your tray, you put it in a plastic bag. And I think Carolyn had all your goodies in a plastic bag. So that would probably be great to reuse. Is Was it big enough to enclose them? You want to pop up? Oh, we had it in a, we had their supplies in a paper bag. We stacked okay. all the uh, okay. Perfect. So basically what you'd want to get is some large, you know, kitchen trash bag that you could close and you would seal it up so it can't dry out. And then you would leave that seed tray in a plastic bag in your garage, in your shed, and basically a place that's not heated, right? Because you're, again, you're trying to simulate winter. So you want the seeds to be cold. So you take your seed tray, you moisten it, and then you put it in the plastic bag. You seal the plastic bag, and then you're probably gonna wanna check it once a month because you don't really know, you can't see what's happening. You can't check on it. You wanna open it up. You wanna see, has it dried out? Because things do dry out, believe it or not, even if they're covered in plastic. Then once the seeds begin to germinate in spring, you're gonna to wanna to look at them more frequently in April and May and things like that, because once your seeds start germinating, if they're germinating and they're in plastic, they're gonna start rotting, those little tiny seedlings. I'm gonna go over this again, but I wanted to answer those questions before we move on for a second, and then we're gonna come back to that. So, um, and we'll have a chance for Q&A if anything um, got skipped over or is not clear. So your seeds are gonna do great. All right, so moving on to the next slide. So again, the seeds that you have access to for this program are bee germinators. And those are the ones that need to experience winter conditions of cold and moist and the experience that shift to spring, which is also moist, but then warm. This is wild bergamot right here with a uh, silver spangle, excuse me, silver spotted skipper. So swamp milkweed. I'm gonna, basically what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna talk about some of the habitat conditions and the joys of growing these plants in your garden as well as how you handle sowing the seeds. So this is being recorded and that video that you just saw will also be on the YouTube channel for the Sarum Conservancy. So you have access to all this material as well as you can reach out to me if something goes by and you, you didn't get it and you feel nervous about it. And I also mentioned there's a couple really great books that you can utilize. Uh, this is William Kalina, Wildflowers. 
book and he has a series of books. Unfortunately, they're out of print, but you can find them. And they're some of the best books about propagation. And I'll spell his last name and maybe someone can put that in the chat. His name is William and his last name is C-U-L-L-I-N-A, Kalina. He's up in Maine now, one of the botanical gardens, and he used to be at the Native Plant Trust in Massachusetts. Okay, so swamp milkweed, Asclepias incarnata. This is a plant that is really easy to grow. If you wanna grow a milkweed plant for monarch caterpillars, this is the easiest one to grow. It's the most forgiving, has a wide latitude of places that can grow from really average soil to fairly moist soil. You can ignore where it says swamp milkweed. Swamps are wooded wetlands. It's really a misnomer and it's a great garden plant. Here it's being pollinated by a great spangled fritillary. And this is a full sun plant. It likes full sun. That's one thing that doesn't have a lot of latitude on. Maybe it could take light shade. This has a fairly large seed. So this would be one of the ones you would surface sow. So you saw me just sprinkling the seeds on top of the soil, firming them down, and then applying uh, grit is what we use, a clay grit, kitty litter, or as part of this workshop, you got sand. All those are fine. You'll cover them and you'll see probably some of the seeds popping out and that's okay. Imagine to yourself that swamp milkweed flying on its little silvery tuft, that's basically landing on the ground and there's probably, it's probably not getting covered by soil. So it's okay, we're simulating nature by just simply using the grit. The grit essentially ensures that the seed has good contact with the soil. And that contact with the soil and that moisture of the soil is what provides that moist condition that it needs to germinate. The next seed that you have that's also a fairly large seed is swamp rose mallow. Those are like the size of a BB. And those love average soil. They'll do just fine. I have really well-drained soil in this gar particular garden here and they grow just fine. They like fertility. And then they can also grow at the edge of a pond in the water. So I have a wide latitude. You can use them for a rain garden plant or in your garden with average soil. And they can grow in part sun to actually fairly dense shade, but not full shade. Again, these seeds, you just sprinkle on the top of the surface of the firm soil. Then you sprinkle over the top your sand or your clay grit, tamp them down and they're ready to go. And these, interestingly enough, they are multiple colors. You see light pink ones down below and then the darker pink up above. They'll be a medium pink and then they'll be perfectly white ones. And that's the way they occur in nature. This is we grow everything from straight species seeds. There's no cultivars and the wild types are like that. They have a variety of colors. Now cardinal flower, you saw me sowing the great blue lobelia. This is lobelia cardinalis. They're closely related, really tiny seeds. It was hard to see in the video in my hand. And if we were, this is one of the great things about when we're in person, the seeds are tiny, tiny, itty bitty. And these seeds, this plant, basically it grows in wetlands and on stream banks. And what happens is this plant goes to seed, the little seeds fall out of these capsules and are swept downstream and then land somewhere on soil. And, and that's it. And they then germinate. They don't need grit to cover them. They just need to be exposed to the light. Now, if you were sewing along with me and you put a little grit on top, it's probably fine. They'll probably find their way to the surface. But in general, if you can, don't cover them with anything. And also a key to know about growing cardinal flower in your garden is just like the seeds don't like to be covered with soil, the basil leaves, which are ones that hug the surface of the soil right down on the ground, they will be evergreen. So they're green probably now, 
and you want them to not be covered with leaf debris in your garden. So if you have cardinal flower, it's great to kind of move leaves and things like that away from the base of the stem and then they can divide and they can come back. This is a plant that grows in, can grow in full sun to part shade. It does like moisture, it does like fertility, and it can be temperamental in that the seed, the, excuse me, the plants don't necessarily last in your garden forever. They can move around. Individual plants aren't really long lived. So if they kind of move around, that's what they're supposed to do. Last thing I'll say about cardinal flower is clearly it's spectacular. And this, if you like hummingbirds, is one of the plants that I recommend that you plant. Anything with a long red tubular flower, bee balm, our native coral honeysuckle, this plant are favorites of hummingbirds. They really love them. And the great blue lobelia, that I was sowing is really great for bumblebees. I don't have a picture of that because I don't think you have seeds of it, but the great blue lobelia is a bumblebee attractant and bumblebees love purples and blues. Golden Alexander is another really great one for your rain garden, for uh, a garden at the edge of a woods that's moist. It can also grow in average soil, a really nice or early mid spring pollinator plant. Those tiny yellow blooms will bring in a lot of solitary pollinators. And these tend to be fairly deer resistant. I didn't, I'm realizing I didn't cover that. And that's always a question that people ask. The cardinal flower is fairly deer resistant. The swamp rose mallow and the swamp milkweed are both really deer resistant. They're really great for our gardens that have a lot of deer, which pretty much we all have a lot of deer at this point. Golden Alexanders also have tiny seeds so that you would treat in the same way as the cardinal flower. Simply surface sow and no need to put the grit on top. And remember, you're labeling everything that you do because once these things begin germinating, um, you probably won't recognize them and take it from someone who doesn't like to label stuff. Just make yourself do it. <laughs> then a last one that I'll mention, I think this is the last one, Blue Vervain. It, tiny purple flowers that bloom sequentially on this spike. It's also deer resistant. I know many of you are in and around the Sourlands. You have your clay soil, you have a lot of moisture. This is a great one for rain garden, for those nice moist clay soils, can also grow in average soil. Many of these pictures that you're seeing here are from my property. Our property here is very, very, very well drained. It was shocking to me to move here from the clay soils of the Sourlands up here to where we have really well drained soil. You put the shovel in the ground, you take the shovel out and a clump of clay does not come with your <laughs> shovel as it does down there in the Sourlands, but you have that great rich fertility there. So blue vervain, anywhere from average to wet soil, it's typically more like a wetlands plant and it likes full sun to part sun. Really wonderful for small bees, pollinators like that. These have the small seeds, you wanna surface sow them. And again, leave those seeds uncovered. So you can kind of see there's a rhythm here. The larger the seed is, those you cover with grit. The smaller the seed is, those tend to need light to germinate. And that's these are the keys that unlock them. Ah, okay, butterfly milkweed. Okay, so now we're getting into some dry soil stuff. If you have happen to have some dry soil, Butterfly milkweed is a great one for you. This of the milkweeds is as commonly found in the nursery trade as swamp milkweed is. It's harder to grow. It, it's taprooted. It really likes drainage. So if you've grown this plant and you've found it hasn't done well for you, think of a couple things. One, think about the driest, most well-drained place on your land. 
Maybe it's some kind of slope. Maybe it's a terraced area. Again, the key is drainage. So it also likes full sun. And you know that that's that's the key to get it get it really going for you. So these you would treat like the swamp milkweed. You sow them on the surface and then cover with grit. And these again host for the monarch caterpillar. Some people will find that their monarchs go more to one species and less to another, or sometimes it changes from year to year. Some people swear by certain species say that they don't touch other ones, but any Asclepius is a host for that butterfly. A great pairing, if you have good soil where you're growing a great patch of wild bergamot already, that would be a good companion plant for the um, orange butterfly, butterfly weed or milkweed. So wild bergamot, is a lot taller. This, like orange milkweed, is also deer resistant. So we have two deer resistant plants in a row. It's actually, they did a great job selecting these plants for this workshop. Wonderful garden plants, many, many deer resistant ones. So perfect for all of us here in New Jersey. Well, bergamot wants full sun and average to dry soil. It grows several feet tall and it is a butterfly magnet it is as good or better, I just want to say better because it's not invasive, better than butterfly bush, which is a non-native invasive uh, shrub. This is a great alternative. It blooms midsummer. The seeds are quite tiny. These you can top dress with the grit and you're using sand in the workshop or you can again use clay, a grit of some kind. And that grit, if you could see, it was about the size of kitty litter chunk, little chunks. And again, that's just use, you're using that to make sure the seeds stay in contact with the soil. If you're doing a meadow, I'll just really briefly cover that just really quick. The keys to think of is basically what you're doing here in your seed trays is what you'd be doing out in your garden. It could be a huge meadow. It could be a teeny chunk of your garden. You want to make sure that your seeds contact the soil so that way they have a good place to germinate and they're also going to be consistently moist. If you have a lot of leaves in your garden, you want to clear them out. And then my advice here of clearing out leaves is sort of counter to what we often think of, but if you're doing things from seed, that soil contact is important. And then you're just leaving there and you're leaving the soil exposed to the elements and then waiting to see what germinates. Okay, so we've gotten through all the plants and now we're gonna quickly review. And I see that chat filling up with your questions. So we're gonna get to things at the end. Here you can see a picture of what the trays look like after they've been sown. We use these big open trays. They're called 1020s because they're 10 inches by 20 inches. And we use a variety of other trays and they just germinate in a blanket like this. And then we pull them apart and then put them in the plug trees that you have. So we've sown the seeds, we've gently pressed them down or tamped them down for good soil, seed contact, and then top dressed if the seed calls for it. And you can see I've labeled. If you look in the sort of top left corner, we have a little labeler there. If you're really getting into this, it's a brother, brother brand and the name of the labeler is called a P-Touch and you can print into it. They're, they're very easy to find, you can find them anywhere. And you type into it whatever information you want and you're doing the name of the plant. Ideally, you're using the scientific name. So you're using Minardi fistulosa instead of wild bergamot. So you have that name, so you know what it is. And then the date, so January, 2022. Okay, can't emphasize enough how important labeling is. So this is the, gonna be the trick. So you all have one tray or maybe you have bought a lot of seeds this 
year or collect a lot of seeds from your garden or from a place where you have permission and you need to protect them from rodents. Here's what we've done. We've built these frames, essentially cold frames. We've protected them on the bottom with rolls of hardware cloth, which you can order online from, we've ordered them from a place called, I think, Mr. Hard, HardwareClothMan.com, which is unbelievable. That was someone's dream to start that website and sell hardware cloth. Um, but you can also get this from any hardware store. We put that on the bottom and then we flip it over and then we cover the top. We've used shade cloth and you could use hardware cloth. You can use a variety of other things. The thing that you need to make sure of is that the moisture can get through. So all the tops of these propagation flats are permeable to ambient moisture, snow, ice, and rain. And this is our propagation area. These, all these frames here, this is how we propagate. We leave everything out. Anything larger than those milkweed seeds or those hibiscus seeds that you have, we actually have stored in grit and they're in the fridge because we found that we couldn't reliably, reliably protect them from rodents. So it's really important. The rodents do get around and they do find stuff and they do eat the seeds. So here you can see the snow has melted and they're beginning, all these plants are beginning to germinate. And at this point, our springs have been pretty dry. Uh, I have been recording the information and noting to myself, wow, it's May and it's really dry. And then suddenly all summer it's, it's soggy. But in spring, you really have to check these seeds and you really have to water them because when they begin germinating, they get really thirsty and they're really vulnerable to desiccation or drying out. Wind and dryness can dry them out very quickly. At this point, you can water gently with a hose, a watering can. You can use a spritz bottle, but you wanna make sure that the water is actually not just covering the surface, but going down into the roots of your germinating plants. That's really important. Germination time is really variable and emergence is really variable. Milkweeds tend, then these are milkweed seeds, I believe these are swamp milkweed, tend to germinate a little bit later. So many of us who are avid gardeners or beginning gardeners, we, know that we're, we notice our garden vegetable plants germinate really quickly. Natives are different. They make us wait. They test our patience and our nerves. And milkweeds especially can be really slow. In fact, every spring, I have to tell people, I'm sorry, I do not yet have milkweeds. Milkweeds emerge really late, especially plants like orange milkweed. They really are waiting for the heat and there's nothing you can really do to goose them along. You just have to be patient. And this is a point where you're going to begin really checking. And since you have trays of multiple cells and you're probably sowing multiple species, you're going to have this really great opportunity to see the difference in what the cotyledons look like. And that's the new germinants, what those first emerging seedlings look like and how they grow, what their growth pattern is, what timing they're using. And note to yourself what's happening in the environment and it's going to be this really amazing experiment. And I hope I hear from some of you what you're seeing in your trays. So this is swamp milkweed, probably sometime mm, end of May. And it's got a couple true leaves. I'd say this is too small to transplant yet. You need probably another rank of growth. I'm looking at this stem and I'm not seeing enough leaves. I'm not seeing the stem be stout and sturdy enough. I'm thinking 
if it, if it experiences the way I water gardens and plants, it's probably gonna get splatted down to the ground because I'm extremely, believe it or not, impatient gardener. And here's an example of some plants that look really great, really stout. This is one of our Senecio or Pacara species. This is probably a couple different kinds, but those stems are really stout, really robust, and they're ready to go into the garden. Really great, beautiful, hardy roots. Again, ready to transplant into your garden. Okay, so now I see that chat all filled up with questions and uh, I wanna start taking them because I know a couple things I wanna just say is that you may have some seeds that germinate and you may have some seeds that do not germinate. And there are two things, there are, there are actually many things that could have happened. Um, the seeds may not have been viable. There could have been an absence of a pollinator. There could have been a really rainy week during optimal pollination times and the pollinators are not flying. So they didn't, somewhat unlikely, um, they could have been eaten by rodents. It's another thing. Sometimes certain years in my nursery here, Jared and I noticed that there's of the 100 species that we grow, there'll always be a certain percent that do not germinate in any particular year, or they germinate very spotty. And that's just, it's, I have learned after many years of doing this, it is nothing personal. It's just something that happens and it's disappointing and you wonder if you did something wrong, but it, it just the, the nature of the way it goes. So just be excited for what you get and then try again next year, take notes and see if you can understand what happened. I'm gonna now open it up to questions. I don't know, Carolyn, do you wanna read the questions off or do you want me to look through the chat? Yeah, yeah, I'll read it off. So oh. um, from Sarah, she said, hi, Rachel, you had mentioned that you're almost finished sowing your seeds for the year. Does that include the grasses, even though they don't need as long of a stratification period? I have sown the grasses, yes. Yeah. And that's a matter of, for us, that's a matter of convenience and you could sow them later, but for us, it's just nice to get them all done at once and they will, they will germinate. And if you get your seed packets um, from a, a place like say Randy at Toadshade Nursery, she's in Frenchtown or from any place you get them online, read the instructions and just follow follow what they say. And it's great to get seeds from a more local native nursery because their seed instructions will be timed towards our, our climate. Or again, this book by William Kalina, and he has this one about wildflowers, he's trees and shrubs, and then he also has grasses, mosses, and information in there is really great. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so Lori asked, is moist mean like a damp sponge when you say the soil is moist? Okay, yeah, so this, yeah, it should be damp, but not soggy. But think about it, if, you're, if your seeds are outside, during the winter, nature is kind of taking care of it. And if you, like last year where we had, um, I don't know, weeks and weeks and weeks of being under snow, they're, it's really soggy and that's fine. That it's, the sogginess is a concern if you have your seeds in a plastic bag. That's where you really have to kind of balance it not being too wet and too soggy. If we have a, a good winter where there's a lot of precipitation, a lot of snow cover, that's, perfect because seeds are blanketed and protected and evenly moist. So maybe the, uh, another way to think about it is evenly moist. Great. Uh, David wants to know if you could put the seeds in a small greenhouse or is that too much light? That's too much heat. So in a small greenhouse, even if it's unheated, the temperatures will get really nice and toasty during the day. And then they'll go way back down 
at night, but during the day, even a small greenhouse on a sunny, even like 20 degree day, if you go in there, it's gonna be, it's gonna feel really nice. So not in a greenhouse. It's not the light, it's the heat, the temperature. Um, Melissa wants to know, should we transplant the seedlings into larger cells or pots before planting them in the ground? You can, but you don't have to. In fact, um, some nurseries will sell you plug trays of the size that you have. And the really great ones are the ones that you have. I think they're like five inches deep as a part of this workshop. And that's perfect. Once that plant gets several inches tall and has roots coming out of the bottom, it, it's great. It's a great size. If your garden, you feel like it's kind of like a wild garden, you got a lot going on, the plants are gonna need to really compete against other you know, big bruiser native plants, then yeah, you can step them up and put them into a larger pot. But what you have now is fine and they'll probably be ready probably sometime around the end of June to plant. And you can leave them in plugs until the fall or you can pot them up. But when you plant them out, just make sure they're well watered as you would with any transplant. Yeah, I used these trays last year, growing them at home and that's what I did. I just grew them up into their big enough, you know, sturdy enough to transplant from those trays. Just. I think also when you're thinking about this for at home, you know, it's more expensive. And a part of this growing it from home is empowering people to do it themselves, but also try and do, you know, if you're going to try to redo your own meadow or anything, that potting mix that you're going to have to keep buying to pot these things up. So, you know, there's that cost benefit of, like Rachel said, making it the plant, having the time for that plant to grow bigger to compete, but also the cost of, you know, the materials to be able to do that. Um, That's a really good point. Thanks for mentioning the cost and the materials. Um, so Kirsten asks, I live in a rented property with a ton of old garden beds that have been taken over and we live between woods and a soy field with a buffer. Can I just plant these natives anywhere? Are they at risk of being choked out? The plants that are part of this workshop that we went over are all like fairly tall, husky, robust plants that will hold their own with others. Ideally, if you're starting a new bed and you've got, you know, a lot of weeds and others, even natives like goldenrods, you're gonna wanna clear a space for some of these plants and the old garden beds will probably be really great, but just, just because they're native doesn't mean that they can like take any kind of conditions. So giving them extra space so they don't get swamped would be great. Um, Melissa asked, should we, or should we not, shouldn't be, shouldn't we not cover golden Alexander seeds? You said not to cover, but the slide says to lightly top dress. Yeah, you can like, you can do, you can do either. I, I would lightly top dress them. So uh, if I misspoke, I apologize for that. And the seeds are tiny enough. You could go either way, but I would probably toss a little bit of grit. I wouldn't like bury them. So. Yeah. Um. Debra asks, can they get too much sunlight in the spring? No, not well, little seedlings. Yeah, if, if it's really bright, hot, and it has been really hot and bright, you know, you can see, let me see if I can go back. This is a shade cloth and we get this in big rolls from Gempler's catalog and you can probably get smaller amounts of it from a hardware store. So this is probably about 50, 
percent shade. So the, the mesh the overlay, they have ratings of how much shade it is. Your other option, if you don't wanna do something as involved as this, and if you're just getting started, you don't need to, you could just put them on the shady side of your house. So it can be on the north side of your house, something like that, a place where you go by regularly so you can see how are they doing? Are they dry? Do I need to water? And so protecting them from like really harsh spring winds, which up by me, we have really harsh winds. And from that really harsh, it, to me, the springs have been seeming like because they've been warmer and drier, the sun has felt harsher. So yeah, just like this side says, protect from really direct sun. Awesome. Um, I also put my germination station, not as nice as, uh, as Rachel has, but you know, pieces of wood with a little screen over the top. And I have mine uh, right at the edge of a strip of woods. And so in the winter and early spring before things leave out, they get a lot of sun, but as soon as things start to leaf out, it gets more shade. Um, so for, you know, you can also think about your property, like what, what uh, Rachel had said about using your home or other existing structures on your property um, for, you know, if you're going to build a station. Um, Carolyn, did you say that you had used old screens from window screens to protect things? Because I've seen people do that too. So uh, a framed out screen from a window, you can get this kind of stuff on FreeCycle or from your neighbor, getting rid of stuff. And for the top, you can use a fabric screen for the bottom, a metal screen would be better. And again, I'm just talking about household window screen, nothing, nothing technical like that. That's a good option to protect and from both rodents and excessive light. Awesome. Um, suggestions for peat free potting mix. It's, it's surprisingly hard to find. And that's from okay. Matt. So for a long time, I will say we were really proudly peat free and peat is a non-renewable resource and the peat that is in, and sorry, this is going to be a long answer. Um, right. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, just like my mom says, you talk too much. So sorry, mom. Um, I didn't hear it. <laughs> so um, we switched to a peat-based soil for a couple reasons. One is because we could not find one that was acceptable and we were having problems with germination. And we switched to a peat-based soil and we got fabulous germination and really beautiful seedlings and really strong growth in all life stages. And we were, of course, very disappointed because we wanted to do peat free. So peat in our soil mix usually comes from Northern Canada. It's being stripped out, it's non-renewable. There's a lot of reasons to not use peat. However, um, there is some evidence that coconut fiber based or core C-O-I-R based soils can have a lot of salts in them and other things that restrict, prohibit, and generally are not great for germination and not really great for growth. And we did side-by-side -side trials with a coconut fiber-based soil homebrew that we made, as well as a peat-based um, professional grade soil. And we use ProMix organic with mycorrhizae. And we get it in these big, huge bales that we have to break apart by hand and mix down and uh, no contest. The ProMix peat-based soil was great. And so I, of course, like to talk to my colleagues about this and you know my disappointment about not being able to find a better, uh, environmentally better mix. And one of the things that we kind of came up with was, was like, you know, what we're doing here is ultimately something beneficial. And isn't it the 
our, our shared grief and pain and uh, conundrum that we face as a human race of in this era now of being able to make these kinds of decisions about how to cause the least amount of harm and how to balance good work with knowing that something else is suffering despite all of our good work. And uh, so long answer, but I, if you find a coconut based mix or a non peat based mix, and, and it's usually the coconut fiber that people are, are using to replace the peat. If you find one, please send me an email and I will try it out. I unfortunately have not been able to find one and I, and there's not one available. We use Griffin greenhouse suppliers and there's, I think the industry has really moved away from coconut fiber, sadly, for good reason. Well, thank you for the truth. I think that's, you know, more important than sunshine and rainbows. So <laughs> yeah, I wish there were more rainbows, right? <laughs> um, let's see. What was the name of the hardware cloth company? I think it's Mr. Hardware Cloth Man. And you can find roll. I mean, we get big rolls of it because you can see, you know, we're building multiple um, uh, frames all at once. So you can go to any hardware supplier store and get um, hardware cloth in rolls. Here, these are, I think, between six and eight inch tall frames and you can get just three pieces of wood, make frame for the top. You know, you can go crazy like this and basically essentially building a cold frame. We like ours taller because we'll grow a lot of plants and sometimes the plants will hang out in these frames for a long time, even a couple of years sometimes. So having them tall, they can get tall and we can hack them back and they just grow and they actually, this black plastic here with the blue stripes that's below everything is a really nice weed barrier, but it's also permeable. The roots can grow through it and rain and moisture can go through it too. So it's, it's um, permeable. It is plastic, but it is permeable. It's a woven fiber. Awesome. CG asks, why yeah. not metal screen on top? I missed that point. I just... Converted. It's just not necessary. I mean, you could, you could do metal on top and bottom. It's just not necessary. The, the metal is good for the bottom because that's probably where most of your rodents are going to come from. And they'd probably chew through something that was um, a fiber other than metal. So that was confusing. I apologize. But you can see here, our top mesh is plastic and because rodents aren't climbing on top and chewing through, but they do chew through the bottom. Let me see if I can get that. Oh, actually, if you can kind of see in this bottom left-hand corner, you can see the bottom has the hardware cloth. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the last question that I see so far is, is it possible to send a list of the sources suppliers to the group email? Sure, yeah. Um, I can send a list of stuff. Um, let me write that down. Send that to us and then we can put it all together and send that out probably next week. Okay. Um, a lot of the things that I use are, are you know, wholesale, wholesalers. Um, so I'll try to find one. I'll put listing down for options that you can use for local. Most of the stuff you can get in any hardware store. Awesome. Um, Melissa, can you expand on that ask in case it was missed about the get involved at home front? Um, and I also wanted to ask, oh, okay, great. I was like, I know it's late, but I didn't quite understand that question. <laughs> um, uh, if you have extra plants, so we gave everyone 20 seeds of each of the different species, and we had six species, then each person got a four out of the six. Um, if you have extra, 
I encourage everyone to um, share them with your neighbor or share them with the local library, create a pollinator garden. Um, if, if you have extra and you wanna give them back to us, we can plant them back at our restoration area. That's awesome. We also have more trees. We planted 10,000, well, 11,000 trees this year in the Sourlands. And they were all in those tubeling trays that you are using. So we have hundreds and hundreds more. Um, so if you want to have more trays, just let us know and we can put them outside of our office and you can take them and go home and fill them and, and seed. Um, I do have some extra bergamot and a couple other um, species. I have a little bit more left. So if you want to grow some more and then freely give them back out into the community, uh, the plant community and the people community, we're all one together. Um, that would be awesome. And, you know, make sure while you're home and doing your growing that you take pictures. It's so exciting. Um, and I think a lot of times we miss that connection, that intimacy with our plant, because as what uh, Rachel was saying, you don't really get to see the seeds and the embryonic stages and, and the, the growth stages of these plants and they're all different and they're all beautiful. So um, I really hope that you, you know, really get close and, and observe them. Um, I did see a few more questions come in. So just wondering if you guys provided peat or core based soil mix in the trays for this class. It is peat. We use the Espoma um, organic seed starting mix. Um, we got it from Bellmead Co-op over in Montgomery. Um, what would be the latest to get these seeds into the soil and started? That was from CG. Now. 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 Oh. Now. Next, the next week, because I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's winter, they need the, this. Um, they need to experience that winter uh, weather. Bellmead Co-op is a great one. Espoma is a great brand. The Espoma brand is the brand that we use for our organic fertilizers. So we are not organic certified, but our nursery uses all organic practices. And, and uh, I've not used the seed mix, but that's what we use to fertilize all of our plants, Espoma, Plant Tone, and Holly Tone. Really great. So you guys will do great with that soil. Um, David asks, what are what about simply broadcasting on bare ground, especially the pollinator mix that came out earlier? So Sourling Conservancy, sent, we send out seeds to our members. We're always trying to get people to grow native plants. So we had sent out a, a pollinator mix. So what are your thoughts on broadcast seeding? Yeah, I mean, I touched lightly on that sort of in the middle, and hopefully that was not sort of a, a, an information overload. Yeah, so you would broadcast them on the ground onto bare soil, so not onto leaves and not onto, you know, weeds. So clear the soil and you can um, sow them directly on the ground. It's a longer haul and you'll have a lot more loss of plant material just because you, the environment that you're creating here with your seed trays is more controlled, but it, you're basically just essentially doing the same thing and you're tamping them down. You could walk all over them. You could rake them in and then you're just stepping back and letting nature have at it. And if you're doing a meadow, you can sow either in the fall or now, or excuse me, in the fall slash winter or in the spring is what I mean to say. So you could sow, you know, October through January or April, May. And you get different germination patterns doing that. You get better wildflower germination if you sow in the fall and winter. And you get better grass germination if you sow your meadow in the spring. And this should begin, light bulbs are beginning to go off in your heads when you're thinking, oh, I've always heard that. Now it makes sense because I understand there are A germinators and B germinators. And so yeah, toss them on the ground now. 
put your plants in their trays now, get them outside now. Um, so even though some of these future plants need full sun, it's okay to have the plugs sitting in the shade. And that's from yes. Deborah. Yeah, because they're seedlings, they're tender. Just like a baby, you know? Yeah, kind of idea. And the last question is from Lori. And she says, can we do pulpy seeds next time? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and they're really gross. <laughs> and I'd be happy to have help cleaning off disgusting, rotting, festering, <laughs> Um, fruity seeds like spice bush and pawpaws and persimmons and all that good stuff. Definitely. But it's definitely got to be in person. <laughs> that sounds great so party to me. Yeah. We have fermented fruits. We could probably have other fermented fruits. I mean, yes. Yeah. A good time. <laughs> like a, a, a hard cider or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. So I think that's. It. Thank you so much, Rachel, um, mm. for sharing your experience and wisdom with us. I've had a lot of fun. I can't believe it's been an hour and a half. I'm just like, can we keep talking? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a lots of questions. And if something comes up, can, can you remind people? So the video is on YouTube and I think you were recording this. So you, you we'll put it send up. all this out next week um, in a follow-up email. So Rachel, if you have a list of suppliers okay. or anything like that you want to send to us we can include yeah. that in the follow-up um and again thank you so much this has been wonderful yeah thank you Sour Island Conservancy you're all really great people you're doing so much for the Sourlands and beyond really appreciate being part of this thanks thank you Rachel this was so much fun I'm glad Carolyn Maya you did a great job thank you everyone and thanks to everyone who came out. This was really terrific. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for sowing native seeds and saving the sourlands. And everybody, if you get too many, uh, too many um, seedlings, then, that, then you can plant in your own garden. Come to the plant swap in the spring and trade them with, uh, with your sourland neighbors. Yeah. Good plan. This was really a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Really